Hey guys, this is AC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is the easiest and quickest way uh, to check a refrigerant charge when you're doing preventative maintenance. So when you're doing PMs, you're assuming that uh, the system isn't low on refrigerant. So in that case, what you may want to do is put quick connect test gauges in, and this way when you check the refrigerant charge, you don't have to do the full disconnect procedure. For instance, if you hook the manifold gauge set up, when you connect with the liquid line and the suction line, basically you have a lot of refrigerant in the hoses. You're not going to end up stealing refrigerant when you're using the quick connect test gauges. So even before you go to disconnect with the manifold gauge set, what you typically do, you'd have to have all the air purged out of all three hoses. And then after this line is disconnected, you've got refrigerant in these hoses. Basically you'd open this valve up. And then you charge the refrigerant that was in this high side into the uh, service hose and then into the low side again. This way you're not taking a whole lot of refrigerant from the system every time you disconnect. But even then you're still taking refrigerant from the system. You're taking a little bit of vapor from the system. Also in reference to your hoses depending on what you've hooked up to lately you know you may may have a little contaminants in the hose or something like that but you can avoid that by just connecting your quick connect test gauges and then you can just go ahead and disconnect them when you're done. Something like this will work on most systems, but a manifold gauge set, which, what is nice about that is you can get the gauges a little closer to your face. Like I said, the issue is uh, getting the refrigerant in the hoses and then having to put the refrigerant back into the system before disconnecting and just having to do more procedures. It just takes a little bit more time. But on the systems that you can connect these, it just makes things a lot easier and faster. You could also use wireless probes instead of uh, this style. So inside, I've blown out the condensate line, I've refilled the trap up with water, I've checked the filter, I've turned the fan on, I made sure we have airflow out of all the registers, made sure that we have the correct uh, CFM, the, the correct duct size uh, for this size unit. This is actually a two ton, 24,000 BTUs. It's 12,000 BTUs per ton of heat removal capacity per hour. 12,000 BTUs is equivalent to roughly 400 cubic feet per minute so that means we need to be pushing 800 cubic feet per minute with this system and our airflow checked out fine so we're going to connect the quick neck desk gauges on first and then we're going to turn the system on Now we're going to connect our dual temperature sensor. This system right here has a thermostatic expansion valve at the evaporator coil. So because of that, because this system has the uh, thermostatic expansion valve as a metering device instead of a fixed orifice like, such as a piston or a cap tube, we're going to be checking the refrigerant charge level with subcooling using the high side gauge and the temperature on the line. And we also make sure that the evaporator coil uh, temperature is above 32 degrees. You can use clamp style uh, K-type temp sensors. I typically use these bead type temp sensors and just a little electrical tape on the lines. Now we're going to go ahead and turn it on. Uh, basically what we need to do is we need to wait five minutes to check the refrigerant charge level in subcooling. We're only going to wait two minutes before checking our evaporator coil saturated temperature. So this is an R410i system, which means that basically we use the pressure and convert it over to temperature. We're going to follow this pink inner ring and make sure that our vapor temperature is above 32 degrees. Basically, it should be roughly around 40 degrees, but that would have to do with the temperature outside and the wet bulb temperature inside. So what I did right there was I made sure that my uh, outdoor unit disconnect was off. I went inside, I turned the thermostat on for cooling, and we got past a five minute delay. I made sure we had proper airflow coming out of all the registers. And then all that was left to do is push in the disconnect outside at the outdoor condenser. Presently, if you can see that right there, the pink inner ring, it's at about 41 degrees. 
and we're just going to monitor that to make sure that it doesn't dip down below 32 degrees. So pressure is about 117 right now and it's going to be adjusting because the thermostatic expansion valve has to have a chance to adjust the refrigerant flow properly. See right now it's at 120 PSIG and then you bring it in it's at about 41, 42 degrees so you see the pressure is rising. So we have right here, T1 is uh, the suction line, so it's the actual vapor temperature on the suction line. T2, which is my second uh, temp sensor, that's on the liquid line, and that's reading 73 degrees presently. We're just going to go ahead and give it uh, five minutes since we can tell that the uh, vapor saturated temperature in the evaporator coil is above 32 degrees. It's actually at a roughly 40 degrees. So we just got to wait our five minutes, and then we're going to check subcooling. So it's been about five minutes and we have a pressure right here of 239 PSIG. We bring it into the pink inner line and we are at about 81.5 degrees saturated temperature in the middle of the condenser coil. So 81.5 minus 70 equals 11.5 degrees of subcooling. So it's the saturated temperature here, right there, minus the actual temperature on that line and we have T2 is the, the bead temp sensor that's on this line right now. So we have roughly 11 to 11.5 degrees of subcooling. Up on the reading plate up top here it actually calls for 10 degrees of subcooling. So 11 to 11.5 that's actually right where I'm looking for. I want just maybe a degree or two above what the unit's calling for on the reading plate. On that plate, it'll say indoor TXV subcooling or something along those lines, and then it'll tell you the actual degrees, 10 degrees, and uh, that is your target. Make sure that your outdoor uh, temperature is above 70 degrees when you check the refrigerant charge. Today, it actually is about 70 degrees right outside right now. Make sure that the sun is not beating down on your temp sensors. Make sure uh, if you're concerned with that make sure that you have insulation around that as well but anyway that's how we check the refrigerant charge so we know everything is good uh, I just went inside and I checked to make sure that we have uh, somewhere between an 18 to 21 degree Delta T across the evaporator coil basically it's the temperature decrease between the return air and the supply air inside the building now as the system runs both the vapor pressure and also the discharge pressure are going to fall uh, that's due to the indoor temperature or the indoor wet bulb temperature actually lowering and the system doesn't have to work as hard. So now I'm going to go ahead and disconnect everything. Now I disconnect. In order to make sure that these valve cores that are in here, also known as Schrader valves, are not leaking, what I do is I end up putting the valve core removal tool on here without the back part of it, and then I put bubble leak detector right here, and I see if any bubbles form. If it does not blow bubbles, then you know that you're good. Okay, that one's good. And I'm just using this to make sure that I don't put the bubble leak detector right in there. It is non-corrosive, but um, this, this tool is easy enough to end up blowing out later with nitrogen. And this is what I'm using. I have that uh, Rector Seal uh, bubble leak detector with a dabber linked down in the description below. All right, so there's no bubbles there either. Then I'm gonna blow out this part right through here to blow that bubble leak detector out of there with nitrogen. But that's how you do it. If you want to help support this HVACR training channel, check out patreon.com slash AC Surface Tech. And if you're looking for the tools and supplies used in the video, I have them all linked down in the description and comment section below. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AC Surface Tech Channel.